back with On the Road of Recovery with Neil from Cincinnati. How are you doing today? Oh yeah, I'm doing outstanding. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us. Uh, could, we, could you start off with describing what your childhood was like? Yes. Uh, first of all, my first name was Robert. Uncle Sam said my first name was my last name. My last name was my first name. So I'll go by Neil today because Robert got in a lot of trouble coming up. Okay. Uh, as, a, as a kid, uh, I had two back. I had two 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 backgrounds. One that uh, I was raised in a in a, in a blue collar home, and uh, I had two parents in the house. I had sisters. I had a dog, you know. Uh, then it was all the illusion was shattered when I was six and a half years old. I was told that I was not that kid, but I was a foster child, and uh, and I was integrated with my biological family. Uh, starting on weekends, which was fun. You know, I got a chance to meet my mom, my grandmother, and my brothers. And uh, and uh, one visit to my grandma's house on the weekend, and she asked me when school was out for the summer, would I like to come stay with them? And I was thinking it was for the summer. So, yeah, I said yes. And as time goes by, and I get uh, my dad asked me, he said, did you tell them people that you wanted to come stay with them? And I said, yeah, for the summer. He said, they're coming to get you for good. And it was a total uh, change for me. Instantly, I became withdrawn. Uh, so, my, and, and with that saying, is that I've, I've experienced both sides of the tracks because I was moved from Kennedy Heights to Mount Auburn, which is a couple, few blocks from here. Uh, so I, I was taken from the uh, blue collar to the lower to the other side of the track, y'all. So it was a, it was a total culture shock. Um, you know, uh, family-wise, had to adapt to uh, another household, get their rules and regulations, and I went from a house that was only f four of us in the house and a dog to almost 13 people in the house. Wow. For my grandmother, her kids, her daughters, their kids. And my, my my three other brothers. So it was a lot of us in the house, and it was a it was different from where I was had everything over here to sharing and losing everything over here. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a culture shock. And uh, then from there, uh, as a kid, I almost with my witnessed my mama being shot five times. Oh my goodness! By her husband. Uh, one the night before they had a fight and. We couldn't do nothing. We hear my mom was screaming as he was beating on her, and we were paralyzed to do anything because we were so little. Mm -hmm. and, mom, and the next day he went to work, and my mom went out and said she'd be back, and she had cooked us food and everything. When he came home, he was fuming that she wasn't there. And when she came home, she asked us to step outside, and next thing you know, we hear gunshots. When it really was that she was trying to shoot him, and he took the gun and shot her. So, but my mom survived. She survived that. And, uh, then have to go from there. We run to my grandmother's house. You know, it, it, it was like I say, it was a it was a it was a culture shock. Cause in my mom's house, there was uh, marijuana being uh, smoked in the house. There was drinking. Uh -huh. uh, but if I if I could really tell the truth, when I was six years old, I go back and it was a mason jar in the refrigerator that I got mesmerized with. It was a clear liquid. It was a mason jar that was, had some clear liquid in it. And I kept gravitating, wondering where it was. What's in that jar? Why nobody bothering that jar in the refrigerator? Mm -hmm. Until one day I got curious. <laughs> and I unscrewed the cap and I tasted it. And, and I heard my daddy coming around the corner. My mouth and throat was burning. And I put it back on it and I'm standing there. And he walks around the corner. He looks at me and just busts out laughing. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my first, my first time trying something that's a mood altering substance mm -hmm. that I come to find out which was uh it was called corn whiskey but which was called white lightning. Oh mm -hmm. which was uh uh what's the name of it? Moonshine. Uh, moonshine. Thank yep. you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the first yes. time I ever forgot okay. that. So it went six few days before my sixth birthday, that's when that happened. And then as I say as being in my mom's house and, and you had you know, different liquids. Jockin when I, I got to know all the, the labels of the liquor. Johnny Walker Red, uh, Night Train, you know, I, and all these names, you know, that I got associated with it, you know, from the bottles, uh -huh. you know, and uh, and uh, so 
it was a culture. Like I said, it was a total culture change from being a schoolboy over here to growing up to something different over here, y'all. So that was my childhood. So the early part of it, right? Not the teenage right. years, right? So <laughs> let's move into teenage years. When did you start um, experimenting with alcohol and okay. or other Okay. Once again, I said I started yep. when I was young. So mm -hmm. uh, we moved to a. Uh, it was uh, about twelve years old. I was staying with my aunt. We was out in my aunt's house out in a community called Wind Terrace, mm -hmm. and I had some cousins, and uh, we were go get us a beer you know because everybody drunk beer then. We, to mm -hmm. us that was no that was a normal mm -hmm. you drinking beer was normal you didn't drink beer then you was you was whack you know you was a punk and you was all this and that mm -hmm. so we gravitated and one night me and my cousin uh we got some beers and we went on the railroad tracks and we there's things they used to have that ran the trains run over and they they, they real loud they call it, uh they sound like m80s but they were also you know we you throw a brick on them and then they had, boom real loud and one night, me and my cousin that did that, and he thought that uh, I was gonna beat him up, and uh, he wrapped a knife in a towel and stabbed me four days before my 13th birthday. Oh my goodness! So I, I almost didn't make it to see 13. So if you ask me today how old I am, I say I'm 13, right? <laughs> uh, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Right. Uh, but that's when I, I started. I started really using it. I'm telling you something. This is what's crazy about it, because I had a partner. I went to her, that. We didn't have weed, so we had this parsley that looked like weed, right? That you we didn't know you cook with it, but it was up in the cabinet, and we would put it in the oven and bake it and wrap it in some brown paper bag and smoke it, right? And uh -huh. you tell me, that's insane. <laughs> yes. So that is truly insane. As a, at a very young age, uh -huh. uh, go from there to uh, gravitate it. Uh, I was uh, 14 years old. And I walked in my mom's room one day because I was wondering what they was doing. I told you I was curious. Mm -hmm. I was curious about that jar. And I was curious about why my mom and it was up in their room so much, in her room. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and I seen uh, my mom's friends and family, a couple of them. They were, I seen them, a, some white smoke being filled in a, in a jar and they were sucking on it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my mom doing it, but I seen it, it, was, it, was, it was in the room. Mm -hmm. And instantly, my mom told me to get my up out of there. Mm -hmm. But I was gravitated once again to what they were doing. So I made it my business to get with someone in her, somebody in her, her, her clique that tell to show me what they were doing. And the next person was across the street, and I called him Granddad, you know. Uh, and I started hanging with him. And one night, I was introduced while he was making his rounds to what they were doing. It was called freebasing. Fourteen years old. So Wow. So That's I go from being young. stabbed at 13, four days before my 13th birthday, uh, to having my stomach wide open, to almost dying, to smoking cocaine. Mm -hmm. And did you, so during that period of time, was it regular use or? It was recreate. It was right. recreation. It was still recreate. I hadn't got hooked or nothing yet, but it was planted. The seed was planted mm -hmm. at 14, and I stopped. I stopped because I wanted to box, and I started boxing, and okay. I went into boxing, uh, and I became. It was the movie Rocky came out, yeah. you, so you know, and I seen the movie Rocky, and I wanted to become Rocky Balboa, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. But only I was. I invented a, a, a person, and his, I invented a, a, another person, y'all. And his name was KC. I wasn't Robert. wasn't cool, you know. I didn't know about Neil yet because it was Robert, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I invented a, a, a person, his name was K.C. Neal. You know, and he was kind and courteous. He was cool cat. When the person messed up, we won't even talk about that, right? His name was Killer Crusher. Okay. So that was my boxing name, Killer Crusher, and I became very good at it. Mm -hmm. K.C. is smooth. And I went and I, at 83 Golden Gloves, I entered and I won sitting in state. Uh, so, you know, dreams, they, they were happening. Mm -hmm. Then after that, I graduated high school. That's something my mom, she required, I graduated. And I went on to, uh, I, uh, but I was still smoking weed. I, I was smoking weed and drinking. And then, bright idea, join our service. Mm -hmm. Go in the army, go take the test. So, <laughs> and for a minute, we were doing really good. And uh, I, like I said, in that process, I had a daughter, was born on the 4th of July. She just turned 38 years old. She is beautiful, you know. She was born on the 4th of July which is the same day as her mother's birthday. She oh, had her on her, you know. Yeah. And so uh, 
then then I have as before she was born, I got somebody else pregnant, which I was my oldest son, Devon's mom. So I have two kids that's nine months apart. <laughs> <laughs> So, the what did you decide to do? I, I, I told you I went in. I, that's why I went in the service okay. to, to make sure that I wanted to, to, to leave a, a legacy, right? And I believe if I had to be in an active duty, I probably would have did some of the things I did because I was only kept. I know I was coming back to the block, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we started smoking, you know, and and, uh, and I believe because me selling weed was the breakup of the relationship between my daughter, mom, and me. You know, it became because I got into it well because she was doing it, and, and I became good at it. And it was animosity, and I didn't know that I was setting myself up for a failure. Then, what I thought was good wasn't good, y'all. So anything that somebody say anything that glitter ain't always gold. Uh, and I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna take this here. I got married 24 years old. I got I got hurt at my job, and my brother took me. He said, "Let's go out on Moosewood." And let's go get some R&R. &R. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what he was talking about. I said, what's R&R? &R? He said, it's Ready Rock. Okay. And 1989, as I got hurt, and I gave into the disease of addiction, I was off and running. Because I told you now, they was only putting it on weeds, the crunchy look, all the curve it, and all this and that, right? But my, 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 my chase was, I really wanted to, what I was doing back in the days, the white smoke. I wanted to see that white smoke fill in the air. And I went in the woods one day and somebody was down there doing it. And I tried it. They called a straight shooter, an antenna. I ain't never heard of an antenna. Nope. And they was down there in the woods outside. And I felt uncomfortable because that's not what I had been doing. Now I'm chasing. Now I'm trying to chase that high, you all right? And I go from being productive to being missing in action. Man, it, it all best for all. And I didn't understand because I said I wasn't like other people. I wasn't outside. I, I didn't look homeless. I didn't look bummy. But I was spending every dime I got because I didn't spend it all in one night. I still was spending my money to put one more with me. Can you talk a little bit more in depth about that mental obsession that, that you experienced? <laughs> when, I, when I say that is that when you become consumed of only trying to get one more, and the welfare of your children, heck, the welfare of yourself don't even matter anymore. I went from being clean shaven to looking like Idiot Mean. If, I don't know if y'all know what that is, but Idiot Mean was, he had all this, right? He had, he had all this. And, uh, and sometimes my appearances didn't match up to my walk. Mm -hmm. You know, I, 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 would, I, I, would, I would be filled with the spirit of God instead of going back to find Mrs. Butterworth. Mm -hmm. And I came up with this thing, when you go to Butterland, all butter rules. Mrs. Butterworth rules. So you know, when you got a plan, you might well throw it out the window. Mm -hmm. You know, you get on, it, it was free, the permission was free. They say it was a song out by, uh, what's it called, uh, Hotel California. Mm -hmm. And I love that song. And it says, you can check in anytime you like, but you can never leave. And that's what happens to me in Butterland. I couldn't leave it. I would get out. I would go to, I'm going to say, I started going to jail for child support. I started going to jail. Here it is. I signed. I took myself downtown, signed up for the United States Army. And so I could pay child support. I signed up naturally to pay child support so it could come out of my check. I started going to jail over and over and over again because uh, I kept chasing one more and I wasn't paying anything, right? I would find, I would be, I would became, uh, a house sitter basically while you was I became when I say that I would get paid when I was getting my temporary disability I would get paid and I would come to I would find people houses that I can gravitate to get high in because I knew I wasn't leaving once I was broke right I was on stay there until and that happened a few times from church I got away with it and some other times that you know when all push comes to serve I had to get out mm -hmm. so you know I became uh, I, I say homeless because mm -hmm. I didn't have an address with my name on it. I didn't have an address, at least, with my name on it. So I kind of found out years later, even though I had a lot of places to stay, I was homeless, y'all. Right. And it took me that road. I went from 20-something years old until I was 40-something years old, y'all. 40, 44, 43 years old uh, of running 
back and forth to Mrs. Butterworth. Mm -hmm. I would get out, go to penitentiary, I would come home. I went to penitentiary three times, and you would never guess for what. It was all for child support. Really? It was all for child support. That's what I was there for, because I should have been there for other things that I was doing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, I never killed anybody physically, but mentally, I've killed a lot of hearts. I broke out my kids' moms, my girlfriends, my mom. I broke a lot of hearts. I killed a lot of people's aspirations and dreams about me, what I should have been. I became a sorry effort in my kids. Like I became a, a unknown, I was like an unknown soldier. And I, and I just didn't, you know, they didn't know me. I had children, but they didn't even know who I was. I recall back when my youngest son was born, I was there when he was born, my only child I ever seen born, and I left to go to work the next day and I got paid and I didn't make it back to the hospital. So can you talk a little bit about uh, when you got to that point of just wanting things to be different, what did you do? I've always, let me say, this is great. I told you, I, 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 I graded in the church. I would go to penitentiary. I would get filled with the spirit. I would lead others to Christ. But I would find myself right back uh, knocking on, a, on, a, on, on your door so I can sit at your round table to blaze up and start looking on the floor for something that wasn't there. And I didn't understand why. Why would I keep going back to something that I don't like? And it was like, it was a, it was a passage that says Romans, right? Four, Romans 7, verses 14. The things I hate to do, I do. And the things I don't want to do is what I do. And I used it. I kept using that throughout my addiction uh, to keep going back. I was, when I go back, you know, that was the, my excuse. It's right there in the Bible. So, and I used that. And, uh, and I, I couldn't understand when I would pray to God, God, I don't want to do this no more. But I would find myself right back out on the outside looking in. But it was coming to an end. And I knew this. And I had a good job. I got down to Duke Energy Center. I got a good job, y'all. got hired on. One week later, I didn't even go back. All for the sake of one more. It, it, the disease was, it progressed. It wasn't like that at first, right? It was fun. It, 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 it was recreational. Then it became, I got to have it, right? I, I got to come up with a, a, a bus of move to get one. Uh, like we call it hitting licks. I became, I became hitting licks. I became selling fake dope to people, right? I would, I would take, uh, if I had to, and this is what I got arrested for. I got a, a felony for doing this right here. Balling a piece of tissue, we'll put it in my mouth and tie it up in some plastic to sell to you so I can get one more. The kind you out of your money. And I went to jail. I was in Amer I was in the Cincinnati's most wanted paper for doing some stuff that I had trying to get one more. And somebody told on me. I told you now these people keep telling on me, right? Hey, they told on me because they wanted that reward money. I was out. I'm running around here with a hood on my head. Like I'm two parts to court talking about you can't see me, picture me rolling, right? Mm -hmm. Crazy as a betchy bug. But to me, I was all right. I, I, I was KC Neal, K with the C, C with the K, Nate Daniel, Eugene, Liz, 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 Neil, right? That's who, I be, that's who I kept saying I was. Until one day, I went up to Akron, Ohio, and my mom's brother, I never met my mom's side of the family up there. And I went there, my uncle, his name was Richard Neal. And I told him how what was going on with me. And he said, listen, he said, son, you, you're like a flower. He said, you're a flower. And you're going to be right now, you ain't even blossoming yet. He said, you're just, just a bud in the ground, seed in the ground. He said, and one day you're going to sprout up. And then you're going to start filling out. He said, call me when that happens. And so I, my, my, my uncle, I had called him one day in active addiction and asked him when he sent me some money. I made up an excuse and he did. And I hadn't paid him back and I was scared that my uncle would come out here and do something to me. So I got clean, y'all. You know? And I heard what he said about that flower. So on March, March, March 21st, 2009, the seed started sprouting. Cause I made a conscious decision. I didn't want to live like the way I was living. I didn't want to feel the way that I was feeling. I didn't want my mind. I didn't want to go crazy, y'all. Mm -hmm. I did not want to go crazy. And I made a decision to go to the Joseph House, which is a, a facility, a treatment facility for veterans. 
Man, that day, I made it. I went and took my assessment. It was crazy, though. I went and took assessment and left there and went cops and dope. And got home, and it wasn't all that good. It wasn't really nothing, because I had nothing to do with it. But that was the last time I attempted to get high. Mm -hmm. March 20th of 2009. So my clean date is March 21st, 2009. You know, And everything they suggested I do, I did. They said, you got to walk out here every day, walk up to our daily bread, which I had to walk through. My, uh, that was a jungle. I got high right across the street from the jungle. Out. All that area, people were doing, just because I was getting clean, nothing stopped. Right. You know, the drug sales, the pills, everything that I had to walk through, the, the, the weed smell, all that was going on. And they said, we want you to go to our daily bread, which is a, a facility that feeds the homeless. And I had to go there and touch the wall. They said, you ain't got to eat there. But you got to touch that wall and come back. And I did it. I did it every single day, whether rain or not. I went up to the wall and touched it. I was afraid to go through there. Mm -hmm. But I, walked, I went through them, and I came all the way around. Then another addict got with me. And when that was our program, we did it. They said, turn your phone in. On Sunday, you're allowed to have your phones on the weekends. But on Sunday night, turn your phone in. I did. You didn't have to come look for me to get my phone. And I started studying the disease of addiction. Okay. What else did you do? Uh, I stopped going around people, places, and things. Because that's what always my biggest hangout. I would always want to go back and let you see how I'm doing, right? Look at me. Look at how I'm doing today. I don't need to be sitting at your round table trying to take over your house. Mm -hmm. So I started doing things. I started, I started studying it. When I say studying, I started, I got the basic text. And I started reading it. I started listening to other addicts that were sharing their experience, strength, and hope with with us, right? I would go to meetings. I, I became a meat maker. Mm -hmm. I, I became a meat maker, you know, and and, I, and, and me making meat didn't make me no punk, y'all, because it didn't make me a punk to say that I was a, my name is Neil and I'm an addict. I didn't make me a punk, right? They made me a man. They made me a man because I could admit when something was wrong with me and I need help. When I admitted, said, well, my name is Neil and I'm an addict, this thing like, the, you know, Mrs. Butterworth was still trying to get me. She was around the corners. Hey, KC, he had to die. KC had to die. That's one thing, the most important thing that happened. He had to die in order for Neil to live. KC died and Neil was, res he, he became alive. KC had to die, y'all. Because he told you he was kind and courteous. He was a cool cat. You know, he was a killer crusher when it came to that. But Neil... Mr. Neal, I, I, I didn't invent Mr. Neal, he was already with me. I became Mr. Neal. You know, and everybody asked me, you know, what's your name? I'm Neal. It says it there. And people say, I say, this is how you can remember my name. When you pray, sometimes you do what? You kneel. So you can always remember my name. And I wanted, I, I tell my kids when they're playing sports, make them know your name. The day they know my name. Not because I hit a lick, not because I fleeced them. It's because they know I am doing the right things for the right reason when nobody's watching me, when I think ain't nobody watching me, y'all. So I started doing some things. I started going to the meetings. I started sharing how I was feeling with other people. I, 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 I became open. I, I became, start sharing about how I was feeling on a certain day, you know, what I started thinking back, you know, on uh, when I was a kid, what happened, some things that happened to me. You know, like one of my mom's friends, you know, which, you know, wanted, they wanted me. Now, I, I, want, I slept with my mama friends mm -hmm. at a young age. Mm -hmm. I slept with them. Mm -hmm. I told you I got with one of my mama friends and found out how to smoke cocaine. Freebase. That was before Richard Parr set itself on fire. That was, I, that was me, though. And I could have been JoJo Dancer. I could have almost, you know, set myself on fire to get away from the disease of addiction. You know, the price that you pay, y'all, is not worth it. So how did you develop a spirituality? Whoa. I, uh, I've always, from a young kid, when we would skip church and play, play hooky in the alley and spend a, the recorder that my grandmother gave us on candy, I always had an inclination of, I didn't know religion. I had, when I got to the North Carolina, I found out how to separate religion from spirituality. Because I didn't know what spirituality, what you mean, you know, it's going to church. But I come to find out and I got clean, y'all. I, I said I started studying the disease 
and became open-minded and willing to learn something different that I come to find out spirituality and religion is two different things. They both deal with uh, a power greater than yourself, right? And me, I had to tap into some a source unknown that was more powerful than me. And, and uh, I've always told you, the lady told me, she said, you got a glow on you. If you keep, if you stay down here, you're gonna lose it. So I, I, I've always had that that glow of the presence of God being around me. And I couldn't see it, but other people did. Okay. When I was doing good, sorry if I keep betting the mic. When, when I was doing good, people would see, after I, I, today, when you look at me, I hope you don't see me because I'm nasty, filthy, and dirty. But I hope when you look at me that you see God. You see some form of God in me or around me or something. And that's what I do today. If you could talk a little bit about how you started to rebuild relationships. Wow. I went to the Joseph house. I admitted that I was powerless, that my life had become unmanageable, that I couldn't do this by myself. And I went to the Joseph house. And 90 days, I, 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 I phased up from uh, treatment to transition. But it was a program going on in Cincinnati, ran by the Tower House called the Fatherhood Program, right? And it was a class taught by Mr. Harold and Mr. Harold and uh, there's two Harolds <laughs> that we would get together and become, learn how to become better fathers, better brothers, better sons. And this program, uh, 2009, uh, I, I, I got into the program, 2009, I learned how to become a better me. And uh, we would meet one day a week uh, at the Tower House right there on Red Road, one of their facilities. Which is a spot at the Tower House where yeah. we at? We located at the Tower House today, y'all. So this is this this only God, right? This is only the God of my understanding, bringing me full circle back, you know, to where I, to where I started from. And so I got into the the, the, the fatherhood program, and uh, and, it, and I started learning some things, right? I, I started learning, so educating myself on becoming a better parent because I always wanted to become. I said I love my kids, right? I always said I love my kids, but they didn't know it because I wasn't nowhere around. I told you I became a sorry MF to them, a sorry effort, right? I, I became a no good, I became a dead. I told them I've been in penitentiary three times for non-support. I, I tell you all these things. I've been to the county jail, I don't know how many times. If I add it all up, I probably did about nine years of incarceration from the county jail to prison because of child support or because of unauthorized use of a vehicle. I get somebody's car and I don't take it back and I'm acting like it's mine. Cause I'm stationed and drunk and I'm riding around and I'm hitting licks. I'm I'm doing the things needed to get one more. Then I get arrested. But the spirituality is uh, God had never left me. And I recall me getting clean, me leading people to Christ, and I would get out of church, catch the bus from church downtown, and put the Bible on my back and put my hand out to the dope man. Mm -hmm. See, just cause you believe in God doesn't mean. If you it, he, that doesn't give you it doesn't just stop right there and I had to find that out right because just believing in God didn't get, didn't keep me clean I had to tap into something else man it, it, it was it's a story I'm gonna tell the story it was a it was a flood in this town and they was evacuating the whole town and they turned they they, they sent jeeps around and they came into this guy's house he said they say get in we're gonna take you to safety. He waves them off. Go ahead. I'm waiting on God. He gonna help me. So they take off. The water start rising. They sent uh, a boat. The boat came through. Pulled up to his house. They say, jump in, sir. We're gonna take you to safety. He waves them off. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm waiting on God. They say, come on. He said, I'm waiting on God. He gonna help me. So they take off. Now the water is rising and he goes upstairs and it's still rising. So he goes up on his roof. A helicopter comes over. Foo, 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 foo. They drop that ladder down. They say, climb up. We're going to take you to safety. So he waves them off. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm waiting on God. He's going to save me. So they, they, they go on about their business. Now the water is rising and he's looking up. It's up to his neck. He looked up to the sky and said, God, I thought you was going to help me. And he heard a voice said, I sent you three people and you sent them away. And then with that, y'all, God kept sending me people, Narcotics Anonymous, AA, and other people, but I kept sending them away saying I can do this by myself. And I couldn't. 
I couldn't do it by myself, y'all. Till I relinquished that thought that I can do this by myself, I was caught up in a grip of addiction, y'all. I was caught up with always trying to find something that was going to change my mood or how I was feeling. So, and when I, when I learned how to let other people in, God said, now I can use you. Now you can learn who you can learn this spirituality part that I am I am love. So you know it's not about going to church all the time, but it's about tapping into a source that's stronger than you. You know, and I, and I couldn't grasp that at first in Narcos Anonymous when they said that you have to uh find a, a, a power greater than yourself. I'm like, it's God, you know. And when I would mention God in meetings and people would cringe. And I couldn't understand that, right? And I felt offended. So I used it as an excuse one time to go out. Not not, not since 2009. I told her I haven't used any mood off the substance. Not NAMP, not a pill, not, not, not for pain, nothing. Since March 21st of 2009. That's my clean date and I'm sticking to it. And kind of first on March 21st was my uncle's birthday. He just passed a year ago, right? So that day, I, I can't trade that in because me and him share that now, right? Me and my mom and brother share that day, the 21st of March. I always remember that. And, uh, you know, when you ask me about when did I realize the spiritual, I realized when I made a conscious decision that it was no longer me, that I started to do the will of the Father. And I started typing messages up every day out of a recovery Bible. And I started sending them out to people since I phased up 90 days out to June 24th. 2009. I've been sending messages out, recovery messages out, inspirational recovery messages out every day since 2009. I stopped for 30 days one time. I said I was thought I was done with you know, I was a book. God said, "No, that ain't what I want. I need you. You are a text message king. Yes, that's, that's your ministry. That was my ministry, mm -hmm. the text message, right? Mm -hmm. And I became good at it. Uh, you know, if I could become good at getting high, how come I couldn't become good at not getting high? So I become, I'm an expert on not getting high. You know why? Because I don't put that first one in me, y'all. I don't do it. I'm not going to do it. I don't put that first one in me. You say, if you don't put that first one in, you ain't got to worry about the last one. Absolutely. <laughs> can you talk just a little bit, and this has been fantastic, but can you talk just a little bit more about how, so when a problem arises in your life, what do you do? Wow. I used to shut down. I'm learning. I'm doing some things around it today. I'm doing some things. Because I, I got a good habit of shutting down on you. And that means, including my wife, shutting down. Don't say nothing to you. In the same household, but don't speak to you. What kind of insane stuff is that? So I'm learning today that uh, not just talk to my sponsor, you know, I got a sponsor. I talk to him about some things, but some things I go to a meeting and I share in the meeting. I go to meetings. They say meeting makers make it. I go to meetings. When they, when they close the meetings down, guess what I did? I got on Zoom, right? I got on my phone, which is an app on Zoom where you can see people. You can, you can interact with people from across the world. And I became friends, and I, I, and I didn't stop just because the meeting shut down. I started sharing more on Zoom. I started hosting my home group, and I got a home group, y'all. My home group is called, check this out, No More Excuses. Not none of the excuses that I can come up with to go screw my life up again. To trade in what I got, all for a, 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 a possibility of a high. Because after that first one, I'm off and running. Everything that I got today, I got my kids back. I was, hold on, I was telling you, I told y'all about, I got into the fatherhood program, right? After my first year, I went into, a, they had a, the Father of the Year Award, ran by the Tower House, right? The fathers that wanted to change, that changed their life. And I said, I want to become the Father of the Year. But my kids hated me, I told y'all that, right? They hated me. They didn't know me. Been in penitentiary three times, locked up in the county jail multiple times, but on, 2009, July, 2000, 2000, no, 2018, 2018, my kids and got together and said, our father is worthy of becoming father of the year. So 2018, y'all was awarded the father of the year award through the Tower House, a big, a big, it's a big thing in Cincinnati. Absolutely, that's spectacular. And you know, and that's amazing. And my kids know the day that I am a part of their lives, their lives, the grandkids. It's not about money. 
I can't buy your love. I'm not going to try. But I can show you that I love you today. My daughter, my oldest daughter, Courtney, I tell her I love her. She would not say she loved me. And I, and I, felt it I wasn't around for her. And it is affecting her relationship with me because she won't tell me that she loves me. But one day she said, it slipped, I love you too. And I've been waiting to hear that for I still, you know, I'm still waiting to hear it again. <laughs> You know, uh, but my oldest son, Devon, he couldn't stand me. Pops, how you doing? In fact, my birthday was last week. Mm -hmm. He came in town for my birthday. You know, he came in town for my birthday, y'all. <laughs> you know, the day I, 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 my mom, trust me, I have keys to my mama's house, y'all. I have keys to jobs, to buildings. I run a company today, y'all. I'm responsible. If you if I got your money, guess what? When you come back, I still got your money. I ain't take your money and try to go re up and, 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 and expand it, right? I got I got your money because the job that I'm asking you to do for me for somebody else, they gave me their money to give to you, and I got your money today. Wow! Imagine that, an addict like me, right? That couldn't get couldn't get one day clean, built the penitentiary, abandoned his kids, owed it. Seventy thousand dollars in child support, and guess what, y'all? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I told you I became father of the year, right? I am almost paid off in child support. I only owe the rears. My kids are grown. I'm almost. I got about another year, and it'd be paid off, right? Me. That man that spent all his money. Cause I got, but I was an active addition. I always kept a penny in my pocket to say I wasn't broke. So I carry a penny with me today, y'all. I'm not broke. I am rich. My spirit is rich. Yeah, I am. I, listen, I'm the richest man on earth right now to me. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because I ain't put one in me. Now, if you're sitting there and you contemplating whether you ain't done yet, I got a message for you. I told you earlier, hold on. Hold on for dear life. As Melanie says, or Attica Cincinnati say, hold on until the swelling go down. Hold on. Now, you're going to get some knots. Hold on. I tell you, I was hard-headed. Hold on. Hold on to the swelling go down. And then hold on some more. You do not have to use no mood off the stuff. You ain't gotta use no crack. You ain't gotta use no 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 alcohol, no Johnny Walker red, no white lightning. You ain't gotta use none of that. You ain't gotta use no needle. You ain't gotta put in that 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 boy, that girl. You ain't got to. Just for the day. You don't have to use. And I live my life just for the day. Tomorrow ain't got here yet. Uh, my answer today is, will I put one in me today? No. I'm safe. I am safe. <laughs> I'm safe, y'all. Now, in order to stay safe, I have to come up with the same concept I did today. When tomorrow gets here, I'll let you know my answer. But I can't give you an answer for tomorrow, right? They say make a plan, right? My plan is to stay clean today. Today, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I ain't going to put one in me. If my dog died, if I leave out of here right now and they get a phone call and say, my mama died, I'm not going to use, because guess what, y'all? I told you I had two families, right? I told you I, was, I had a family over here before I met my biological family. When my mama died, right, I had the keys to her house, and I went inside her house and found her dead. Guess what I did not do? I did not use. Rule number one, if you follow this rule right here, there's some rules in all kinds of numbers in, in recovery. If you follow these rules, you never have to use again. Rule number one, that is, y'all ready? I want you to say this with me, right? No matter what, just don't use. Rule number 10, no matter what, just don't use. Rule number 100, no matter what, just don't use. Guess what? If you follow rule number one, you ain't got to worry about rule number 100. You just follow rule number one, no matter what. You just don't use. You don't have to use no matter what, y'all. My brother, my baby brother died. I have not used. I have not came up with a concept to use, y'all. My dad died. I, 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 I have not used. My uncle died, right? Then I look just like. I have not used. I got divorced. I have not used. I had a stalker that put me in jail. Because I threatened the stalker through a text message. I didn't know. I knew who it was. I, I threatened him through a text message. And I went to jail. Clean. But guess what, y'all? I have not used. And the day I'm married, I'm married to a beautiful woman. You know, I'm married to an addict. Right. My wife went and used uh, uh, something, appeals. 
And I had to learn to cope with this with all the lies and the manipulations. I had to learn how to challenge my anger, my frustration, and not leave my wife because she was down. And I didn't, y'all. And today, if you ask me somehow, how can I? It's a book, y'all. It's a book called, if you have having, you having troubles with you no know, relationship, I encourage you. It's a book called Real Love and Marriage. Mm -hmm. And it is awesome. It is so awesome, y'all. And, and I, I, I'm in a men's group on Monday nights. It's called the Men Mobile Man Cave. We meet Monday nights and we, we chop it up, you know, spirituality. You know, we, we, we get real. You know, and that's why I say I talk today. I, I'm a, when you ask me to come here, I don't mind, you know. <laughs> right. I told you before when I was coming up, but I say, I scream and holler for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> but today I'm, I'm screaming and hollering because I want to see you not make a decision that you made yesterday. You don't have to live yesterday life today. Live today. If you made a mistake yesterday, that's fine. Even if you made one today, guess what? You got an opportunity because people are dying left and right for trying to put one in on the day. And I don't want to wake up and look at the paper or somebody say, hey, you know what's the name of They died. They was, they was trying to put one in them. When I die, it ain't going to be because you ain't going to say, have to worry about, was he using? You ain't going to have to worry about that. Guess what? I know for a shadow of a doubt today that I ain't put one in me. You can't even get me to take a pill. That if it's narcotic, I tell my doctors, I don't want anything that's narcotic. I, I keep it 100 with them, right? Because I'm not trying to be a trickster today. I'm not trying to fool you or myself, thinking that I can handle it. I'm not telling you if you will prescribe medication not to take it. That's me. I'm telling you. I just can't. I don't want to take a chance because I know that feeling before when I when they shot me with some morphine because I had I had surgery. And that feeling instantly, and it made me, I never want that feeling again, y'all. I never want to feel like the presence of God leaving my body after taking that first hit. I know what it's like, y'all. I know what it's like to take that first hit and feel like God just, 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 just left you there. I will never want that feeling of me knocking on your door in the rain and asking, can I come in and take a, get a sleep? Or do you got something to eat? I could have never put, my, put myself up to get a sign and ask you for a court. I couldn't do that. My pride was too much, right? So I almost starved to death sometimes out there, especially in my mind. I told you I didn't want to go crazy. And that's one of the reasons why today, just for today, I, my name is Neil. And by God's grace and mercy, I celebrate 12 years, four months. What's today's date? The August 3rd. August 3rd. And 12 days clean of any, did you hear what I said? Of any mood, altered substance. And this is what I tell everybody. If you have not used, I'm going to ask you something now. When it, listen, when y'all look at this, right? When y'all go back and when y'all ask you this question, if you have not used any, and rules on our cause and honor, we all say, we all have today. So if you have not used, we all got what? Just today. And I say, yeah! That's my thing, y'all. People know me by that. They know my name. They know that I have not came up with a bright idea to put one in me. So if you see me on the streets, if you need to talk to me, I'm going to put my number out there. And I'm not afraid. I want you to reach out to me. My telephone number is 513-473-8004. That's 513-473-8004. If you're feeling down, out, you feel like you just, you know, you just want to give up, call me. Call My phone stays on, y'all. It may be on silent sometimes, but that's still, I, I'm going to get it, the message. And if I don't answer, guess what? That's why you pick somebody else. You get more than one telephone number, right? Because I may not just be around. I, I could be out of town somewhere. But get more numbers. Call people. Call me. Send me a letter, right? My name is Robert Neal. People don't even know like I don't even know my first name, y'all. They know me by Neal. I told you they didn't know I'm Mr. Neal today. I work with felons through sudden change. We hire felons, y'all. We give you second opportunities. I'm a part of a ministry called Impact Change Now. Look it up. Look at Impact Change Now and see what we do. We stop, we're out here by stopping the violence. We're out here by changing your life. We can only change one man's life at a time. And we start with you. I had to start with me. Somebody gave me opportunity. They gave me opportunity today to come here and share my spirit, strength, and hope with you guys. So don't be afraid to say, Hey, I need help. Don't be afraid to cry. I'll cry in a minute, y'all. I ain't scared no more. Listen, my name is Neil, and I approve this message. 
thank you so much. Your story is definitely going to help somebody that's out there struggling. And for those of us that are in the rooms as well, we very much appreciate you being able to lift our spirits. Thank you. <laughs>